This is a production of Cornell University. All right, so um, like Sarah said, my name is Chris Fernandez, fourth year student with Michael Mazurik. And if you can't tell from the title, I'm going to talk with you today about how we're trying to leverage genomics in our squash breeding program. I could have also easily called it um, gain from three cycles of genomic selection in squash, but that seemed less exciting. <laughs> so I find that most people aren't super well acquainted with squash, so I figured I'd include some fun facts in the front here. So squash, um, when we talk about squash, we're usually talking about three um, cultivated species, and there's these three species that we eat and that we work with. And those are cucurita pipo, which is there you go. Cucurita pipo, which is your acorn, delicata, pumpkin, jack lantern type of squash. Cucurita moshata, which is like your butternut. And we have the Hubbard group and others in uh, Maxima. And so these are the, the three main squash that we work with. These are examples of winter squash. So there are two kinds of squash winter squash and summer squash. Winter squash you eat mature, summer squash you eat immature like zucchini. And so I'm mostly going to be talking, or exclusively going to be talking about winter squash. And so yeah, squash has recently been sequenced all three genomes. Um, it's got like a super small Arabidopsis size genome, but like 20 pairs of chromosomes, which is kind of cool. Um, other fact that I want to point out is squash is already like overflowing with nutrition. If you eat a half cup of squash, you get 110% of what you need, or of vitamin A that you need for the day. So when we talk about um, breeding, like improving squash fruit quality, we're mostly talking about making it more appealing to consumers so that they'll take like eat something that is nutritious for them. So I just said squash fruit quality. When I talk about fruit quality in squash, I'm talking about color, sugar, and starch. So color is mostly dictated by carotenoid content in squash fruit, which we can measure with HPLC or with colorimeter. Um, sugar is, um, affects sweetness of the squash fruit. We use a refractometer to measure that. And then starch affects texture. And we measure that with dry matter, which is highly correlated trait for that. And so. Our main project goals, as I mentioned, are to use genomics and integrating that into our breeding program. So today, I'm mostly going to be focusing on how, we're use, how we use genomic recurrence selection to, um, uh, in our program. I'm also doing work um, It's more at aimed at understanding squash fruit quality, whether, whether it's components, how are they inherited. I probably won't have time to get to that today. So mostly about uh, genomic selection stuff. So like I said, we're talking about how we've implemented genomic selection in our program. Um, so before I get into genomic selection, I want to talk briefly about what the phenotypic selection cycle looks like. So it's a year-long cycle. We have one cycle of selection that happens after we phenotype. So we have to grow the squash in the field. Um, we get the fruit. We bring those fruit inside. Um, these are like 50-pound bags of squash that we hand carry, load into the truck, and bring inside. So I like to say that squash bringing is a full-body workout. Um, so we phenotype it at the, at the fruit stage, which means that we only select on the female parent. And you only have one cycle of selection. It's very labor intensive. But the main problem with squash is that it's the hummer of the plant world. So squash consumes tons of resources and takes up tons of space. So <laughs> the squash field here might look like it has a lot of plants, but that's only 200 plants. So we can't have super huge populations. Also in the greenhouse, same problem. This is like 20 plants here, maybe. And then in storage, this is one experiment that we need to harvest and or that we need to process before it rots. So space and time constraints are all issues that we really have to try to deal with in squash breeding more so I think than a lot of other crops. Um, so one way that we're, um, so we're trying to implement genomic selection to try to sort of get around some of these problems. So we're using genomic selection to, we're genotyping at this stage before we plant and then we can get the data back and make selections before flowering. So we're controlling both parents. And then also we're still doing another cycle of selection in the greenhouse so we can get two cycles of selection per year and control both parents. And so that's how, and also at some point we update the model because we get phenotypes as we're going. So this is sort of how we're trying to use genomic selection. Um, overview, we're doing it, we did it in a biparental because it's the easiest sort of population to do it in. And you know, it's already enough of a challenge for us to try to integrate this in a squash program. So we figured we'd just keep it simple. Uh, we're doing a rec recurrent selection scheme with 200 plants. We're, top, we're selecting the top 10% for bricks, dry matter, and color values. And once again, we keep it simple, keep it GBLUP, um, doing multiple traits. So we use a multiple trait model where we're basically selecting on one value at the end, which is just equal weighting of all three of these fruit quality trait values that we get from the model. So that's how we're doing selection. Um, so F2 between honey nut and bugle, 
We chose those because we've used them in our program a lot. and We've derived some very nice F6 lines from them, so we know there's potential. So that's why it's a perfect test for our genomic selection pilot study. Phenotypic data, the main takeaway here is that all of our traits are normally distributed, quantitative traits. Um, they're correlated in favorable directions, so we should be able to get high bricks, high dry matter, and then high color value, which is what we want. So this is sort of what we're looking for here. Some very elegant um, genetic parameter um, figures for you. Uh, bricks, dry matter have similar moderately, I don't know, kind of low heritabilities. Uh, color value has slightly higher heritability. And all the traits, as we would expect, are genetically correlated. Those are the pain to be core. They're also genetically correlated. Um, this is just from the multi-trait model. We can get that. Um, this wonderful GWAS plot is supposed to, uh, GWAS uh, slide here is supposed to show you that all these traits don't really have any major effect loci, so it makes sense to use genomic selection in this situation. Um, so then I have some cross-validation results. So we have the base population and then another population that we use to retrain the models. And you can see we have uh, moderately strong cross-validation values. So we can't do super good, uh, super well. We can do, we can do okay, especially in this, uh, when we retrain the model, we had some better data. I think we were able to do a better job. So we actually did selection too. So we, we, we have cross-validation accuracies and we set up the scheme. So I did one, I did one round of phenotypic selection followed by three rounds of gen, uh, genomic selection. And then this year I grew out all from remnant seed the populations um, at three field sites, randomized complete block design to look at um, gain from selection. So these are the results. So here we have three populations, block two, or three locations, sorry, block two, East Ithaca and uh, organic. And we have the uh, base population up through the final selected population. So space population after phenotypic selection, after um, an intermediate genomic selection round, and then the final round of selection. And so you can see in most of the locations, it looks like we enriched for individuals with higher index values. So this is, uh, we don't have this population in this environment, but for the most part, it looks like genomic selection worked for us. We were able to improve, um, enrich for higher index value individuals. I don't have a picture of it, and I don't, I don't think in these slides, but also if you look at each of the traits, so bricks, dry matter, and A value, you also see that each of the traits also increased. So we increased total index, but also we increased all the traits slightly. So that's what we wanted to see there. Um, so further work, I mean, obviously, um, there's a lot we can still do with this data set. So we're looking at, looking at correlated gain from selection of other traits. So we measure length, width, um, weight, yield traits. And so we can look at what happened to these traits as we selected for fruit quality traits, looking at realized heritability, gain per cycle. You can already kind of see that. But um, so yeah, we're going to be doing all that stuff, looking at inbreeding, that sort of thing. Also, I saved pedigrees from this stuff. So we can look at how well pedigree selection, or using just pedigree information we've done for us, and use that to compare with genomic selection. And then squash breeding 3.0, which I say is bigger and dirtier. So bigger, I mean larger population size and dirtier, just cheaper lower quality DNA extractions, doing more plants. So I think we're kind of looking, because we have sort of low, lower prediction accuracies, doing more of a genomic enrichment situation where we're screening you know, a couple hundred plants as squash seedlings, throwing out like the bottom 50% and proceeding from there. And then also looking at, um, looking at some of these post um, storage quality traits that we have in squash. So this is an example of hollow neck, which is not desirable. And obviously the phenotype just gets to squash for months. Special storage conditions, so we could develop prediction models for this trait. That would be super cool. So this is sort of where we're looking to go. Um, I guess I have a little extra time. So I, I have a minute. All right. <laughs> so really quickly, just so you know, we're also interested in understanding fruit quality in cucurbita, and we're interested in understanding how this varies within species and between species. Also, you know, just look at how we can potentially bring together. Um, different species to get what we want in, in squash quality. And so the experiment, I'll just tell you really quick, is we did, um, we have data from different time points in squash development at different cultivars. We did a bunch of, um, quality, did a bunch of quality trait measurements, look at profiles, and we're combining that with gene expression profiles to try to understand better what's driving squash fruit quality within species and between species. So 
that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my advisor, Michael Mazurik, my committee member, Lee Lee, who's here right now, um, Jessica Rakowski, who's in the Philippines, um, also the core Mazurik lab, our wonderful uh, lab techs, field tech, and the rest of the Mazurik lab group, and also various other individuals who've helped me along the way, and our funding source uh, for this grant from the USDA NEFA grant. And I guess with that, I'll take any questions that you have. So the question is, when, how often do we retrain the model and um, what individuals did I use to do that? So I, I had asterisks in here somewhere, but they disappeared. But here, we trained the model initially, and then this is a greenhouse generation, and then this is a field generation. So we retrained at this point and then did these two, this last cycle using the retrained model. So this is, we retrained at this point here. And actually, I end up just using the C2 population, the new training population. I didn't. Um, try to combine the two populations because there's some the data quality was just a lot higher in this population that specifically the, the GBS libraries were a lot better we got higher quality genotypes so I just decided to go with that so that's what we end up using Mark um, I haven't looked at that yet so I mean I can look at the raw data but there's some outliers and stuff in there so it's kind of hard to tell whether we've reduced Variants and I'm sure there's probably been some in breeding though. That also might be part of the reason, in addition to higher quality, why we have maybe slightly better prediction accuracies. We still have variation, but they're more related. So that could be a reason that I have higher accuracies here. But yeah, I haven't looked at that yet, but we definitely will look at that. All right. Thanks. All right. Let's thank Chris one more time. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.